Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you all for being here, either in person or online. So, uh, yeah, as uh, uh, Professor Bonifazio Raisa told you, my name is uh, uh, Riccardo Gier, I'm a researcher in historical general linguistics at the Università Cattolica di Salvatore. And um, so um, I'm here, uh, and my host here is Professor Anna Bonifazzi. Um, and so uh, our project deals with the connection between traditional possibility and impossible reality in Homeric poetry, the, uh, poetic the most ancient poetic text of ancient Greek literature. And uh, most, more precisely, we uh, try to show that this connection may be explained in the light of two uh, concepts. One from literary theory, mimesis, which you probably all know from Auerbach's uh, monograph, of course, and one from cognitive theory, uh, compression, cognitive compression, uh, and so on. The, two, the three narratives that we will look at are the myths of uh, a myth with pra uh, of Priam, king of Troy, the myth of Demeter and Persephone, and the uh, myth of Baldur. And here you see uh, three different uh, pictures from the three uh, myths. So, uh, sorry. Okay, so what, we, what will we do today? First of all, I uh, will uh, briefly introduce to you Homeric realism in the light of Auerbach's and Bakker's interpretations. Then uh, I will introduce to you the three uh, most important concepts uh, uh, of this uh, um, of this talk, namely blending, compression, and decompression in cognitive linguistics. Then we will have a look at the narratives that we will uh, actually uh, have a look, uh, uh, that we will actually analyze, namely narratives that assess the so-called katabasis theme. Uh, and these uh, three narratives are uh, the 24th book of the Iliad, uh, the most ancient uh, epic poem in ancient Greek, uh, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, another uh, Homeric poem, uh, but uh, probably less uh, ancient than the Iliad, and the Baldur myth, a myth uh, which is actually told in Old Norse sources from the Middle Ages. We will uh, have a look, then we will have a look at two case studies, uh, hopefully, but I think so, yes, and then uh, in the end we will uh, um, summarize our conclusions. So, first of all, uh, let us uh, briefly introduce what Homeric realism, realism is, in the light of our Bach and then of another scholar uh, inter um, of Bacher's interpretations. So, in Odysseus' Scar, first chapter of his seminal volume Mimesis, the representation of reality in Western literature, Eric Auerbach advanced a highly influential analysis of Homeric poetry. In his view, Homeric narration is a process driven by the externalization of phenomena in terms perceptible to the senses, and therefore Homeric narration knows no background. So, according to Auerbach, in Homeric narration, a continuous rhythmic procession of phenomena passes by, and never is there a form left fragmentary or half illuminated, never a lacuna, never a gap, never a glimpse of unplumbed depths. And this procession of phenomena takes place in the foreground, that is, in a local and temporal present which is absolute. Roughly at the same time, the scholarly community was progressively embracing a new understanding of the origins of Homeric poetry, so-called oral theory. The fathers of oral theory, Homerist Milman Perry and his disciple Albert Lord, convincingly demonstrated that the pervasive use of fixed formulas, like uh, the well-known swift-footed Achilles, or traditional thematic structures, like uh, the scene of arrival, which uh, always looks the same in all Homeric poetry, the same things happen always in the same order, um, so, the, the, the pervasive use of these fixed formulas and these traditional thematic structures within Homeric poetry were a reflex of its oral traditional composition. What does that mean? In other words, Homeric poetry was composed by oral traditional poets, uh, which means poets who were able to improvise long and complex narratives within a single oral performance by making use of traditional devices, from smaller uh, formulas to larger thematic and narrative structures traditional devices which they had in turn learned uh, by listening to a large number of previous oral performances by other poets. So basically, oral traditional poets learned their craft just like children learn their, their language, their parents' language or languages. And Paris and Lord's research found support, great support in extensive fieldwork on a living oral tradition, the South Slavic tradition, which confirmed several of their hypotheses. 
In relatively uh, recent times, Egbert Bakker has reassessed... Well, why am I telling you all this, which you definitely already know? Because in relatively recent, time, recent times, Egbert Bakker has reassessed Auerbach's chapter on Homer in the light of new developments in Homeric studies involving both the study of oral traditional poetics and insight from cognitive psychology. Bakker showed how Auerbach's emphasis on foregrounded detail is, a formu is an apt formulation of uh, uh, the aesthetics of oral traditions, of how, how oral traditions work. Because both contemporary and earlier evidence show that uh, oral poets indeed need concrete visualization to facilitate memorization, memorization and recall. And uh, for, uh, my host, Professor Bonifazi, has, for instance, written about this with, together with David Elmer. Um, and Bakker cites the following interview with a Scottish bard, which I reproduce here because it's very, I think it's very informative. So the Scottish bard, uh, this is actually taken from uh, Rubin 1995, who also takes it from MacDonald 1978. So the, the Scottish bard um, describes uh, the, uh, the performance, the oral performance uh, in this way, in the following way. Um, you've got to see it as a picture in front of you, or you cannot remember it properly. I could see, if I were looking at the wall there, I could see just how they were, how they came in, the people, and how this thing was, and that, and the other. Yes, it's easier to tell a story right through from the beginning, because it's there, in front of you, to the end, all the way. All you have to do is follow it. There was no vision ahead, but just as you went ahead yourself, and the vision kept pace with you just as if it were coming upon you, like that. So, this shows how visuality in Homeric narration uh, relates to a dynamic sense of perception. Within the transmission of the poetic tradition, the reality being perceived, so seen, and reenacted in the ongoing performance, relies on previous perceptions, that is, on previous performances of the same poem. So, uh, this way, Bakker reaches an understanding of the term mimesis, which is actually in line with the etymology of the Greek term, uh, which is to imitate. In Bakker's term, the concept mimesis encapsulates the relation between an action and its model, rather than between a sign and its referent. And this is actually consistent with Daniel Kurligan's forthcoming etymology of the family of mimesis uh, as a reflex of a root may, which means to exchange. So to exchange your personality with that of your model. So, we can think of oral traditional composition as the dynamic relation between traditional possibility and actual performance, and understand Homeric realism as the highly developed ability of ancient Greek oral traditional poets to visually actualize, make real in their minds, the aesthetic and narrative possibilities offered by the tradition. And what does uh, possibilities mean? It means the previous performances of the same poem that have been memorized. Um, and they do that by, uh, in the form, and they actualize this uh, reality in the form of a single poetic reality, which is, which must be, of course, consistently construed in itself. So it must make sense. It must be a narrative which makes sense. And it must be appropriate to the social context in which it takes place. So it must be suitable to the audience of the performance. Um, however, uh, as later argued by Bakker himself, Homeric poets were also masters of interformularity. They didn't just repeat uh, poems uh, the way they heard them. They were able to consciously quote multiple distinct traditions, so combine distinct traditions within a single oral performance, and uh, unifying them into new complex versions which establish logical and casual relationships between the different traditions. And I studied this in a 2020 paper. Therefore, instead of theorizing an opposition so to, between a single traditional possibility, the memorized previous performance which is used as a model, and the actual performance which, uh, uh, which um, enacts, uh, makes real the traditional possibility, we should rather speak of a multiverse of traditional possibilities which oral traditional poets were able to select and combine with each other in order to construe an aesthetically and logically acceptable poetic reality within a single oral performance, which could later become a further model. Once, once it was performed, it could later become a further model, a new traditional possibility for a new future performance. However, an important question uh, quite naturally arises from such considerations, namely, 
especially since it involves such complex conceptual processes, how could Homeric poets always be consistent in their realism? The answer is that they didn't. Homeric narratives are full of inconsistencies and incongruent details. And here comes uh, our project. Um, we, with our project, uh, Professor Benfazi and I aim to explore precisely this. If Homeric poetry is a mimetic narrative, how do we explain narrative details that actually clash with a realistic representation of an event? When narratives include unrealistic details, impossible realities, uh, and therefore, yeah, sorry, and therefore convey an impossible reality, how can the mimetic quality be accounted for? Also, which unrealistic clashes can be found and on which level? Our proposal is that impossible realities in Homeric narratives may often reveal so-called cognitive compressions, taking place whenever oral traditional poets are combining, and the uh, technical term here is blending, multiple traditional possibilities within a single actual performance in order to construe a single poetic reality. So here comes blending. Uh, let's uh, introduce the concept of blending. Conceptual blending or conceptual integration theory was developed in the early uh, in the 90s and the two, early 2000s by uh, and it's still being developed, but it was originally developed by Fauconnier, uh, Guy Fauconnier and Turner, uh, Mark Turner, uh, to explain how humans make sense of the world around them through a process of imaginatively blending existing concepts to arrive at new understandings. Conceptual blending theory thus describes how humans process and rationalize information through blending existing mental spaces to produce new mental spaces with emergent properties. Uh, what this means basically uh, that humans uh, naturally combine different uh, mental spaces, which means portions of, conce of conceptual uh, matter, portions of thought, um, with each other in order to produce new uh, mental spaces, new portions of uh, conceptual uh, material, which, however, are not just the sum of the, pro of the elements uh, in the two input spaces, but have emergent properties. They have emergent meaning. Together, they are more than the sum of the two input spaces. So, and this is a typical uh, graphic, a typical scheme of a blend, in which you have the two input spaces, the blended spaces that uh, results from the two input spaces, and a generic space which um, has the two uh, elements that are shared by the two input spaces. So blending sounds like something complicated, but it's actually a basic mental operation, which takes place all the time uh, in uh, our life, but definitely plays a pervasive role in language and communication. Also, uh, it has also been applied, already been applied to mythology, and for a blending approach to an ancient Greek mythological motif, you can, for instance, have a look at Pagan Cristobal Paganova's uh, 2011 article on the errors of law. But how does blending happen? Uh, in order for blending to happen, we need vital relations, which are relations which provide the basis for mental space connections between elements and relations and uh, between elements and relations in any given network of spaces. In other words, if I blend, if I say the, uh, the sentence "Ricardo drinks uh, coffee on Monday and Tuesday." I'm blending two input spaces, one in which Ricardo drinks coffee on Monday and the other one in which Ricardo drinks coffee on Tuesday. Um, and uh, the Ricardo in the input space one, where, which takes place on Monday, has a vital relation uh, of identity, which you can see it's, it's the second here in the, in the list, with the Ricardo in the input space two. Whereas uh, Monday in the input space one has a relationship of time, of course, uh, compared to uh, in, in, with, the, uh, with the element Tuesday in the input space two. But in order to blend all these elements, we need to compress, we need to uh, compress these vital relations. We need to make these two elements one. We need a single Ricardo. Rather than two Ricardo who are identical to each other, we need a single Ricardo, a unique Ricardo. And in order to do that, we need compression. Compression is fundamental uh, for blond blending theory because all blended mental space are compressed. And uh, in order to take, pl uh, uh, to take place, uh, compression, so compression means to um, contract the relations between elements. So um, to uh, take a relation of identity between the Ricardo in the input space one and the Ricardo in input space two and contract it into a relationship of uniqueness. So, from the point of view of evolution, uh, to confuse, uh, so uh, con uh, compression sounds like something that we shouldn't do because uh, it doesn't make sense. But actually, we do it, and we do it all the time because it's how uh, our 
mind works, but most importantly, it's, our crea our, it's how our creativity works. And um, Anna Bonifazi, in her 2019 article uh, on uh, compression in uh, Homeric poetry, uh, also um, cites this uh, wonderful example from uh, Cologne, of course, so from, our, uh, from the cathedral in Cologne. This uh, tomb of a, a dead bishop who has his eyes open, so he looks alive, and looks at the roof of the church where a painting of the afterlife is. So we have a dead bishop with eyes open, who looks alive, therefore, and who also looks at the afterlife. So a blending of three different moments in the existence of this bishop's soul. Um, but in order to appreciate this, so if, if you... Uh, if we if we only were able to perceive the blended uh, the blending so the already compressed um, mental space um, we wouldn't be able to appreciate its complexity. In order to appreciate its complexity, we also need the compression, which is the unpacking of compressed relations between the elements. It's the flip side of compression uh, because we need to and we need it because in order to achieve a under, an understanding of complex phenomena, in order to appreciate their inner complexity. In other words, if we just had a look at this uh, dead bishop with eyes open looking at the uh, painting of the afterlife, uh, without uh, being able to unpack the fact that this statue is actually a blend of three different moments in the existence of this dead bishop, then uh, the blend wouldn't work. The reason why the blend works is that is uh, that uh, is um, that it uh, we in any time we are able to unpack to decompress the uh, the blended space the compressed elements in this in this blend. So we are able to understand that we are looking at a, a statue which compresses in a single uh, object uh, the life, the death, and the afterlife of the same bishop. So we decided to uh, we decided to um, uh, focus on narratives and more specifically on incongruous details, which uh, uh, in, within narratives seem to uh, allude to clashing narrative strands, um, making the, the story compressed. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, I, what, what I didn't tell you uh, is that uh, the reason why we blend, the reason why we use blending and compression, is because the world is way larger than we are. Uh, and we need to, in order to understand, in order to grasp things, we need to uh, make them smaller, more understandable to us. So, um, um, the narratives, uh, so we decided to focus on narratives which uh, discuss the processes of dying and of traveling to the land of the dead. Because, of course, there's nothing that is less easy to understand, less easy to grasp than death. And so, these are uh, death is particularly apt to conceptual compression. And here you have two examples from uh, two fairy tales, the uh, Sleeping Beauty fairy tale and the Red Riding Hood fairy tale, in which, of course, uh, for instance, in the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale, it is obvious that uh, there is a blend going on, going on here, because um, Sleeping Beauty sleeps, but she sleeps uh, forever, she never wakes up. And that, of course, is a compression, a blending of two different things. Death, something that uh, takes place and you don't move and you never wake up, and sleep, something we do every day, something that we are very able to understand, very uh, uh, able to grasp, and which uh, helps us uh, understand better the concept of, at least within this narrative, the concept of, a, um, of a, an eternal sleep. And the same is true for uh, Red Riding Hood. Again, an incongruous detail is the fact that Red Riding Hood uh, comes out of the belly of the wolf as if she had been swallowed whole, but of course, you're not expected to be still uh, all in one piece if you've been swallowed by a hole, by a wolf. So uh, we chose to uh, we chose to focus on narratives about gods and heroes who journey in search of lost or dead relatives, so-called katabatic uh, narratives. Um, we did that because uh, all of these narratives attest uh, some realistic and coherent plot elements, which uh, allow us to reconstruct. An overarching uh, narrative structure in which uh, we always have the same roles, the same props, and the same tracks. But on the other hand, these narratives also display incoherent or incongruent plot elements, which, as uh, Anna Bonifazi uh, proposed, um, are uh, perfect uh, for us to uh, are clearly uh, evidence of the insertion of narrative aspects 
which uh, evoke different themes, narrative themes. So within a single narrative, you get incoherent plot elements that clearly are uh, point to a different narrative theme from the one you expect. So, uh, catabasis, uh, and catabasis is one of the possible uh, covert narrative oral traditional themes that you can have. Um, catabasis, as you might know, uh, is, means to go down, and uh, more precisely, to go down to the land of the dead. But of course, it's a heroic theme, so you don't just go down, you're supposed to come back. And uh, it has to do with ritual, it has to do with death, and therefore also with ritual. It has to do with fear, it's a frightening experience. And it has to do with ghosts, of course, with the uh, souls of the dead. So our first text uh, was is um, the, the first text that we are uh, focusing on is Iliad 24, the 24th book of the Iliad, in which the uh, old king Priam, the king of Troy, journeys to the tent of the hero Achilles. Uh, why? Because, uh, of course, uh, you all know this, but uh, he does that because um, he wants to ransom the uh, corpse of his dead son Hector, which uh, Achilles is keeping by his tent. So, um, several catabatic elements uh, have been already uh, noticed in this uh, text, and they have been discussed in the literature and uh, by uh, several authors. I uh, refer to uh, you. Uh, I refer you to the article by Herrero de Jauregui in 2011, uh, Priam's Catabasis. Um, so, uh, as already uh, proposed by uh, Bonifazi in 2019, uh, this text blends at, uh, in, in a conceptual, uh, uh, sorry, in a cognitive uh, uh, science uh, perspective, uh, we can say that Iliad 24 blends at least two scenarios. One in which we have Priam's tra uh, travel within the land of the living, uh, from Troy to the tent of Achilles, and one where Priam experiences catabasis. And we can see that from uh, several um, from several details. Uh, for instance, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, the text tells us that the kinsmen, of course, the kinsmen weep because Hector is dead. But the, te the text, the Iliad, also tells us that the kinsmen weep because it is as if Priam is going to death. Also, uh, there is a general sense of danger, and the travel takes place in the dark. And Priam does not taste food or drink, something which is, of course, can also happen in a real tra in a real journey. But it's very much connected to catabasis, as we will see right away with the other in the other text. Also, uh, the god uh, at some point uh, Priam meets Hermes, and Hermes escorts Priam to Achilles' tent. But Hermes is, of course, the god who takes the souls of the dead and brings them to Hades, to the realm of the dead. So. Um, Hermes is the, exactly the god you expect to escort uh, Priam to the realm of the dead. Then uh, Priam meets Achilles, who of course is Achilles, a hero, a human hero, but actually Achilles is also described, as we will see, as the king of the dead, and we will see why. And Achilles' tent is of course a regular war tent of a military chief, but it's also described, as you will see, like a huge palace. The palace, uh, and this probably uh, actually likes uh, it, it looks like it looks like the palace of the king of the dead. Um, another detail uh, which uh, points to catabasis is a river. A river works as a liminal place on the way to the Greek camp, but actually rivers, as you all know, will also work as infernal rivers because uh, crossing a river often marks the transition from the realm of the living and the re to the land of the dead, and uh, and so on. The second narrative we focus on is the Homeric hymn to Demeter, uh, an early, uh, a more recent uh, text, uh, oh, but still uh, Homeric, uh, so still Homeric poetry, which tells the story of uh, Dim the goddess Demeter's search for Persephone, her daughter, who has been abducted by the god, the king of the dead, Hades, um, who wants to marry her. So it's also the, a story of forced marriage. Um, this story, this narrative. So I've I've been studying this for a, this text for a while, and um, and uh, as uh, so, um, I give an overview of all this in a, a 2020 report from my fellowship at the Center for Hellenic Studies. Um, so this text uh, has a narrative complexity, with it, which clearly reflects a long process of oral traditional composition, within which multiple distinct traditions of various origin progressively came to be compressed into one single narrative by establishing logical and causal relationships among the narrative elements from each of these traditions. So you don't just get uh, distinct traditions uh, juxtaposed to one another, but you, they are actually combined in a way that is supposed to make sense. But sometimes 
does not, as we will see. So um, narrative things that are compressed into the single into a single plot within the hymn, and which uh, we uh, are going to have a look at uh, today, are. Demeter's literal search for her daughter, so Demeter literally searches for her daughter, she can't find her, but also Demeter's experience of catabasis, because Demeter experiences, uh, um, in, a, in a way, she goes down, as we will see, and uh, at some point, however, Demeter cannot go to the realm of the dead, because uh, in ancient Greek mythology, gods do not uh, approach death in any way, it would make them impure. The only god who can indeed uh, approach the realm of the dead is the god who usually brings the souls of the dead to the realm of the dead, and that's Hermes. So once more we have again Hermes, uh, this time uh, experiencing Katabasis himself. So um, for, we see this from several uh, different uh, elements. On the one hand, uh, Demeter, uh, the story, in the story of Demeter's search for Persephone, uh, she goes from heaven down to the earth. But on the other hand, it's also the story of a journey from the land of the immortals to the land of the mortals. So it is still a catabasis in a way. Also, the travel takes place for nine days. Remember this detail, nine days. And it probably takes place in the dark, as we will see uh, l later. Also, Demeter does not taste food or drink, just like Prime which is something that also is very catabatic, and she also does not wash herself. Uh, at some point she meets a maiden goddess, Hecate, Hecate who is also associated with death, as we will see, but the Hecate fails to help her, because it is Hermes who actually helps Demeter get Persephone back. Hermes thus guides uh, Persephone back to Demeter from the land of the dead, but there is also a, a, a version, as you can see in Richard's own 1974 uh, commentary, in which actually uh, Demeter uh, manages to do that herself, but not in this narrative. So, uh, Hermes uh, takes uh, the role of the, uh, of, of the hero here, and he goes from heaven down to the underworld this time, so down from to the... and of course, uh, this also means that he goes from the land of the living to the land of the dead, where he meets, on the one hand, a living Persephone. Why living? Because, of course, Persephone is a goddess, and uh, the word for god... one of the words for goddess in uh, ancient Greek is immortal, atanate. Um, so uh, Persephone is by definition alive because she's a goddess, but she's also dead, as I've tried to show in a uh, in a two, in a 2021 article. Uh, 2021 article, Persephone is consistently described as someone who is dead. So on the one on the other hand, Hermes actually meets a dead Persephone, and also uh, as we will see, uh, well there are many other elements. Let's uh, perhaps not. Uh, tell you all of them, uh, but I'll tell you this one that we will not uh, uh, focus on later, namely that Hermes and Persephone also fly over mountains and rivers, which of course seem to work as a uh, real, uh, as a liminal place on the way back from the underworld, but they also work as a transition, they also mark the transition from the land of the dead to that of the living. So, uh, uh, the, the third story that we will have a look at is the Norse Baldur myth, and more specifically, the episode of the hero Hermodur's search for the god Baldur after his death. So, Baldur is, a, uh, is one of the few gods, uh, famous gods at least, who die. And uh, this story is pro probably very well known. Uh, it's, it was first written down in the, in the 13th century, but after a long period of oral transmission by Snorri Sturluson, an Icelandic scholar. And this myth is very complex and has long noted parallels in Demeter's myth, in the Sleeping Beauty folktale, in Near Eastern religion, in Celtic poetry. And I have argued that some shared elements between the myth of Demeter and the myth of Baldur may have parallels in various other Indo-European traditions and therefore maybe reflect inherited ancestral Indo-European poetic and mythological material. Two narrative themes, among many others, which are blended within Baldur's myth, which find clear, clear parallels in both Priam's and Demeter's narratives, include, on the one hand, Hermodor's literal search for Baldur, but on the other hand, also Hermodor's, Hermodor's experience of catabasis, because Baldur um, is in the land of the dead. So once more, uh, we have several elements which point to this. Uh, on the one hand, um, for instance, the travel takes place for nine nights, again, the number nine, uh, in the dark, uh, explicitly in the dark. Um, and also, uh, there, another parallel with Demeter's story is that uh, in a very similar episode after Baldur's death, another god, not Hermodur, but uh, another uh, friend, uh, does not wash his hands. So, again, we have this uh, catabatic theme of uh, not washing uh, and so on. So, uh, 
Her mother also meets a maiden goddess, Modgudr, who uh, is supposed to guide him to Baldur, and she actually does it. And that's, uh, she guides him to the land of the dead. Where Hermodor meets living Baldur, on the one hand, so he meets Baldur who is a god who, by definition, should be alive, of course, and also he acts as if he were alive, but he's also dead, because he's, of course, dead, he's literally uh, said to be dead, but he's also in the land of the dead. Um, so, uh, here we have uh, another element which we'll have a look at later, but uh, briefly, let me tell you that uh, another... Um, so. Another uh, element is a river. Again, we have a river which works as a liminal place on the way to Baldur. But of course, this, this river is called uh, Gjöl and it's an infernal river. It, uh, crossing the river Gjöl marks the transition in Old Norse mythology to the land of the dead. But uh, enough with this theory. Let's have a look at, the, uh, at some uh, practical uh, cases, case studies. So, let's have a look uh, at two case studies. First of all, let's have a look at, uh, at a case study involving a very long night, a river, and a conversation. Uh, let's start with Priam's story. Priam travels by night and stops by a river. Um, he stops the horses in the river to drink, uh, for darkness had by now come down over the earth. When they stop, uh, Priam, so uh, by the river, uh, Priam meets Hermes, uh, who in the text is called the, uh, the helper. God who guides, uh, of course, Hermes in Greek mythology is the god who guides souls to the realm of the dead. Hermes uh, asks uh, Priam what he is doing, uh, and Priam, as a very polite person, answers, uh, which is not obvious, as we will see. And uh, there is a formula used here, which is ton de meibet. This will also be relevant later on. Because, uh, so after Priam answers, they actually have a small conversation, but then Hermes leads Priam to destination. Let's switch to, let's, uh, let's now uh, talk about uh, Demeter's myth. Demeter travels for nine days and she has torches in her hands. Torches in her hands, in Homer, as we will see, means in the darkness. Um, on the tenth dawn, Demeter meets Hecate, the goddess, as a god who is uh, a goddess, a Greek goddess who is very much associated with ghosts. And Hecate also asks the matter, Demeter what is going on. But the text strangely tells us that she is actually giving news. The text tells us that she spoke to give her news, Angeleusa. And then she says, who of the heavenly gods has seized Persephone? So who is the uh, interrogative pronoun, this? So um, it's a question, it's not news. Demeter, even more strangely, Demeter unpolitely does not answer. Um, and uh, so, ten duk eme beto mutui is the Greek text, uh, but uh, she still follows Hecate to destination, so uh, everything still goes on as expected. Third myth, uh, Baldur myth, uh, the hero Hermodur, who is called uh, Hermodur in Kvati, which means the brave, must find Baldur and beg Hel, Hel is the name of the goddess of death, to release Baldur. So Hermodur travels for nine days, the text says nine nights, but uh, this is actually not relevant because night was the standard unit of time in Old Norse, so nine nights means nine days, nine days and nights, of course. Uh, through valleys, dark and deep, so that he saw nothing. So So he travels in the dark, and he travels um, until he comes, so I forgot to write it here, until he comes to a river, uh, to the river Gjöl. Um, yeah, there he meets a maiden, Modgudr. But Modgudr, so uh, the text doesn't say it explicitly, but any Old Norse speaker would have probably recognized Modgudr as the name of a Valkyrie, because the elements are uh, those that you would expect from a Valkyrie. And Valkyries, as you might know from uh, Richard Wagner, uh, were divine maidens who guided the souls of dead warriors to the realm of the dead. Then Modgudr asks Hermodur who he is and why he is traveling, and Hermodur answers. Um, and after uh, and after that, Modgudr leads Hermodur to destination. She tells him, uh, "Downwards and northwards lies the road to Hell, Nidrok, Nordur, Ligur, Helvel." So, all these shared elements between these texts uh, allow us to uh, reconstruct a katabasis theme, a common, a shared katabasis theme which I believe to be uh, to have uh, some uh, uh, connections with in the European uh, poetic uh, poetics, but it, this doesn't concern us. What concerns us is that we have a shared 
narrative structure here uh, as, an, as one input space in uh, each of the tradition-specific blends. And this input space um, has the following elements. After nine days, in the darkness of death, by a river, a brave hero encounters a deity who guides souls to the realm of the dead. The deity quest, um, asks a question to the hero, the hero answers, and therefore the deity causes the hero to reach the realm of the dead. Now, uh, this input space of Katabasis uh, is uh, in the tradition-specific blend of uh, the myth of Baldur, um, is blended with the larger narrative, uh, which, however, is uh, basically a very uh, straightforward catabatic narrative. So there's not much uh, compression going on here. Basically, for instance, here uh, you can see that we have uh, the Hermodur in input space 1 and the brave hero in the input space 2, Katabasis, but actually uh, uh, Hermodur is just a value uh, which fills the role brave hero. So uh, it's very straightforward, and uh, but it, it is interesting to note that the Hermodur, the brave, so the brave is the epithet of Hermodur. So he's so much a brave hero that that's actually his epithet, Hermodur the brave. So uh, there's not much, uh, so this is a blend, of course, but it's not a blend that requires much, uh, that has incongruous details, because uh, there's not much clash between the two different input spaces. Um, so, in the end, we have a blend in which, after nine days, in the darkness of death, by the river Gjöl, which is, is uh, well, the river Gjöl, Hermodur, the brave, uh, the brave hero, encounters Modgudur, the Valkyria, who is a deity who guides souls to uh, the realm of the dead, um, who asks a question, he answers, uh, she uh, leads him to uh, the realm of the dead. So, pretty much, uh, pre quite straightforward. Uh, very different case is a, a very different case is the one of Priam's journey. Priam's journey is a very uh, complex blend in which uh, the katabatic theme, the katabasis theme, has to uh, interact with a larger narrative in which um, Priam's ransom of Hector's uh, corpse, Hector's uh, body, must take place within a single day. So you don't have nine days, and it takes place in the darkness of night. The main character here is Priam, who is an old king, um, and he must reach Achilles' camp, not the realm of the dead. So in the end, you get a blend in which, within a single day, in the deathly darkness of night, by deathly I mean that uh, the text um, very much describes uh, this darkness as something very death-related, by a river, King Priam, acting as a brave hero, encounters Hermes, the uh, deity who guides souls to the realm of the dead, who asks a question, um, Priam answers, and then Hermes uh, causes Priam to reach uh, the destination, which is Achilles' camp. But, um, of course, uh, yeah, so, sorry, what, what do we have here? We, we have here some, uh, so here we have some, re some elements which clash with one another. Element A, within a single day in input space one and after nine days in the catabasis input space, of course, um, have a relation of time. They are, uh, of course, uh, different uh, um, durations, which, however, uh, must be blended into one. And this is uh, solved by compressing the relation of time. So from nine days, we go to a single day in the blended space. Um, and the same is true for King Priam. His role is, we have a compression of role here. Uh, on the one hand, Priam is an old king who uh, is not supposed to do uh, things that a brave hero would do, but he does that here. So we have here a compression of role. And the same is also true for, for uh, the relation of space between Achilles' camp and the realm of the dead. They are two different places which are compressed into a single space uh, in the blend. Uh, but actually, the most interesting blend uh, right now for us is Demeter's journey, because Demeter uh, in, the, in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, the blend needs to compress, needs to uh, so uh, um, the blend. Sorry, <laughs> the catabatic theme is blended with uh, the larger narrative of Demeter's search for Persephone, and this uh, this larger narrative has several clashes with the catabatic theme. First of all, uh, so we have the goddess Demeter, who at dawn is seeking news on Persephone's location. And she that cannot reach, so she's unable to reach Persephone's location. And she's also, uh, for some reason, she's also unable to speak. Basically, as we will see, 
um, because she cannot uh, find her daughter, she also uh, cannot uh, speak, basically. It's a way of, uh, it's a symptom of her sadness, of her distress. Um, so I could, uh, so I will just list uh, the elements of the blend and then we can have a look at the single uh, element. After, so in the end, after nine days, at dawn, but with torches in her hands, Demeter, acting as a brave hero, encounters Hikate, the, the a deity who is associated with the souls of the dead, who asks a question which is presented as news. And Demeter does not answer, but still Hecate causes Demeter to reach a goal, a destination, which, however, is not Persephone's location uh, because uh, in the realm of the dead, because um, in the, in the, in the, within the larger narrative, Demeter needs to keep searching, otherwise the text would uh, end. So, these, uh, all these clashes lead to formulaic uh, and lexical incongruities. Basically, formulas and words are used in a way which is not supposed to happen in Demeter's journey. And we think these uh, incongruities to be products of blending. For instance, here we have Aithomenas Daidas, which means uh, uh, lighted torches. So, uh, in the Katabasis input space, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the element B. Uh, the journey must take place in, th in the darkness of death. But uh, in Demeter's, uh, in the larger narrative of Demeter's search for Persephone, uh, this uh, uh, meeting needs to happen at dawn. So, this disanalogy between these two elements results in a clash, which is resolved in the blend by composition, which is one of the ways that, uh, by which blending takes place. So, um, this, uh, this event takes place at dawn, as uh, we uh, expected, but it also takes place in the dark, because Demeter is said to have uh, torches in her hands. And uh, torches in her hands is a metonymic way, is metonymic with darkness. You cannot have torches in your hands in Homeric narrative if it's not dark. You can see that by uh, the two examples here. So, um, in, uh, in the American to Demeter, you have this formulaic expression, Aitomenas daidas metachersi nehusa. Uh, holding lighted torches in her hands, which you find identical in Odyssey 7, 100 uh, something, uh, where uh, some golden newts held lighted torches in their hands. Aitomenas daidas metachersi nechontes. And they did so to give light by night. Finontes nuctas. Also, uh, uh, this larger formula is made up uh, of uh, a smaller formula, which is Aitomenas Daidas, uh, lighted, uh, blazing torches, lighted torches, which is also used uh, at night. For instance, here, you know, they say in the uh, example above, uh, Telemachus goes to bed and his, um, so his uh, servant Eurycleia um, comes with him bearing blazing torches, Aitomenas Daidas Fere. So, Again, at night. So it's uh, by by, by uh, because Homeric poetry is formulaic and traditional. It's very likely to uh, that uh, the f the use of this formula is metonymic for darkness. So on the one hand, Demeter uh, this happens at dawn, but in, on the other hand, it also happens at night, at, or at least in darkness. Another element uh, which is problematic in the Katabasis is the question by the deity who is associated with death. Because uh, Demeter uh, does not want anyone to see questions in the larger narrative of the Homeric hymn. Uh, Demeter is herself asking questions. She is herself seeking news on the location of Persephone. So it's Demeter who should be asking questions to Hecate. Uh, this disanalogy, uh, again, leads to a clash which is resolved once more by composition. Because Hecate, on the one hand, um, asks a question. Because that's what she does. But this question is presented as news on Persephone, because the verb used is angello, which in Greek means to give news, to announce. It's, of course, related to angel. Um, so, uh, in, the, in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, we read, and uh, Hecate spoke to give Demeter news, angeleusa, and then she asked the question, who, this, has seized Persephone? And um, this is very weird because Angeleusa, especially this lexical form, uh, this specific uh, uh, form, Angeleusa, the, the participle uh, and the feminine and so on, is never used if not with the meaning to give news to announce. I actually think that the verb Angelo is only used in this meaning, but definitely this formulaic uh, form, this form in the formulaic language of Homer is always used in this meaning. So, and you can see that in the... Uh, 
seven examples uh, that you can see uh, on the slide. For instance, uh, she went herself and spoke the message to Zeus. Again, uh, speaking the message, Angeleusa. Another, uh, another example is the fact that uh, Demeter does not answer. Uh, on the one hand, uh, a catabatic narrative uh, requires the person who goes to the realm of the dead to answer the question of the deity, because it's a sort, it's a form of uh, test, basically, that the hero needs to uh, um, pass. But on the other hand, uh, within uh, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, um, the, um, Demeter cannot speak because of her, of her sorrow. This is basically part of a larger uh, poetics of distress that I uh, studied during my fellowship at the uh, Center for Hellenic Studies, by which uh, the distress of Demeter is expressed by a series of negated things. And one of them is not speaking. Demeter does not speak. She sits, as you can see in the example uh, on the uh, right uh, here, <laughs> um, she uh, does not speak. She sits in silent sorrow, aftongos, she greets no one with word or movement. And this is typical of this, uh, na this kind of narratives also in other Indo-European traditions. For instance, in the Hittite uh, myth of Telepino, which was already compared uh, by Walter Burke, uh, an important uh, scholar, of course, as you know, um, was co who I think was here actually, as a fellow perhaps, but in any case, uh, or anyways, uh, he was definitely uh, somewhere uh, at the Auerbach. But in any case, um, uh, as I tried to show, uh, within this myth, Telepino does the same thing. He also does not want to speak because he's in distress. And here you can see a line where he says, uh, why did you make me speak when I was silent? So Demeter cannot speak because she's in distress, but she needs to answer. And therefore, uh, yeah, uh, this is solved in the blend by selection. Only the element which is uh, which uh, can take place is um, is used but still we have so the Dimitri in the end does not answer um, to uh, so does not reply uh, anything to the question by Ovecate but still we have the use of the verb amable For in some way the poet needs to say the word answer which is amable in uh, the verb amable which is amable in Greek and uh, but he of course he needs to use it with a negation uk in ancient Greek. And this is very rare in Homer. There are only two other examples in Odyssey and two out of, uh, I think, hundreds of times that this verb is used in Homeric poetry. So this is very strange to use uh, amable answer reply with a negation. Um, and notice that if we took the negation away, then we would have exactly the same formula that is used in Priam's narrative. But Priam has no reason not to speak, so he actually answers to Hermes' question. So, here we have our first uh, case study. Uh, let's briefly have a look at the second case study involving a gate, a palace, and a spatial seat. Um, in Priam's myth, uh, at the beginning of the narrative, Priam um, needs to reach Achilles' camp and ransom Hector. And uh, so, what we already saw happens, and then Priam and Hermes come to the walls of Achilles' camp, and Hermes makes Priam cross the gate. Priam and Hermes reach Achilles' war tent, and the word is Clisienne, but this war tent is described as a huge palace, which is reminiscent of Hades' mansion, as shown by, for instance, Herrero de Jauregui. Um, Hermes then gives Priam some instructions and leaves, and then Priam gets off his chariot and leaves the horses and mules to the herald Aedius. Then Priam enters the tent, and finds Achilles sitting apart from his comrades. So he sits apart in a special place. And then Priam begs Achilles to release Hector's corpse. Now, this is extremely... So uh, uh, I will turn immediately to uh, the Norse narrative because it is extremely similar to the Norse narrative. Because what we have is that, again, at the beginning of the narrative, so before the episode that we already mentioned, her mother had been asked to find Baldur and beg Hel, the goddess of death, to release Baldur. So, then uh, what we already saw happens, and then at this point, at some point, her mother comes to the gates of Hel. The, the, which Hel is both the name of the realm of the dead and the realm of the dead. Sorry, the name of the goddess of the, of the dead and also the name of the realm of the dead. Just as in Greek, Hades is both the name of the god of death and the name of the realm of the dead. So Hermoder crosses over the gates, because he has a divine horse who is uh, very powerful. 
he reaches Hell's Palace. Uh, in the translation, you can read Hall because the word used is almost Hull, which means Hall, but it also means King's or Earl's Palace. Then Hermodor gets off his horse. He enters the palace. He finds Baldur sitting in a special seat, in the seat of honor, i Öndugi. And then Hermodur begs the goddess Hell to release Baldur. Um, so the Homeric King to Dimitri here is too uh, so the, the structure is too complicated, but I just wanted to show you, just want to show you a, a few elements, not all of them, but a few ele elements that are relevant here. So uh, again, uh, at the beginning of not of the whole narrative, but of this section of the narrative, Zeus commands Hermes to convince Hades to let Persephone go back to her mother Demeter. Then Hermes enters the palace of Hades. He finds Hades and Persephone seated on a funeral couch. Hermes asks the god Hades to release Persephone. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, and then uh, there are other parallels, but uh, we have no time to uh, have a look at them right now. But this was very relevant uh, because um, we need to uh, reconstruct uh, the elements of our Katabasis theme as one of the input spaces in each tradition specific blend. So, what we have here is again um, a realm of the dead, a ruling deity of the realm of the dead. A palace of this deity, of this goddess or god, a brave hero, a dead relative of the brave hero, and then the brave hero comes to the gate of the realm of the dead. He crosses this gate. He reaches the palace of the of the god of death, uh, or goddess of death. He gets off. He gets off his horse or uh, or uh, or chariot. He enters the palace of the uh, deity uh, of the palace of the <laughs> of the goddess of death. And then he finds the ruling deity of the realm of the dead sitting on a special seat. And then he begs this uh, deity to release uh, the dead relative. Again, uh, again, her mother's uh, journey is very uh, much a, stra a straightforward catabatic narrative. So there's not much uh, incongruous details here, but there is one which is interesting to, to us because um, this, uh, the, the input space 2 blends uh, with an input space 1 in which uh, we have, of course, Hel, uh, the, the ruling deity of the realm of the dead in Old Norse, uh, Hermodur, the brave hero, Baldur, the dead relative of Hermodur, and, uh, but Hermodur, um, as we can see in the... Uh, so Hermodur needs to find Baldur. Uh, and to beg uh, Hell, the goddess of death, to release Baldur. So, um, this leads to, uh, I believe, no, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, so basically, uh, this leads, yeah, uh, to a formulaic and lexical incongruity because uh, her mother, um, uh, so the catabatic theme needs the brave hero to find the king of the dead sitting on a special seat. But actually, her mother had been told earlier, as you can see in the in the in this example here, to find Baldur. So uh, her mother needs to find Baldur. So um, this this analogy between uh, the two uh, themes is uh, solved, uh, which of course leads to a clash, which is solved by composition. So her mother finds Baldur, fulfilling his role in the uh, input one, so in the larger narrative, he needs to find Baldur, but he finds Baldur sitting on a special seat, which means in the seat of honor, and which is really unexplained if you have a look at the literature on this myth. It's unclear why Baldur would be in a seat of honor uh, in the realm of the dead. I think it is because Baldur is actually filling a role here, which is uh, the role of someone else, the role of the god of death, who sits on a special seat. And uh, this was apparently a very uh, problematic element in the Katabatic theme because, because it also leads to a clash in the Homeric hymn to Demeter. I don't uh, show you, I won't show you here the blend of the Homeric hymn to Demeter because it's super complex, but let me just show you this uh, strange detail. Um, Hermes, basically, uh, when he arrives to, uh, in the realm of the dead, he finds Hades and Persephone sitting and Lechesi. And Lechesi means on a, uh, so literally means on, uh, Lechesi is the dative plural of Lechos, which means bed or marriage bed. But the formula en Lechesi, literally on the bed, is only used of funeral beds, of beers, as I've tried to show in a 2021 article. So, and you can see that from the examples here, uh, in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, if you read en Lechesi, this formula, it means that someone is dead. 
So it's not normal for us to, for Hermes to find Hades seated on a beer, Hemenon and Lechesi with Persephone. And I think that this, uh, this is again, uh, uh, the result of blending. Hermes needs to find Persephone. That's his role. But Persephone, as I've tried to show in the same uh, publication, is that, uh, she is described as a dead person. She's a goddess, so she cannot be dead, but she is described in the same way a dead person would be described. And therefore, she is described as sitting and lehesi, like a dead person. But, uh, Hermes needs to find first, uh, so, the death god sitting on a special seat. So in the end, you get a single element in which, by composition, Hermes finds Hades and Persephone sitting on a very special seat, namely on a corpse bed. Uh, finally, uh, Priam's journey. Uh, uh, yeah, very quickly, Priam's journey. Uh, so we need Priam to reach uh, the Greek camp where Achilles is in his tent, and uh, he has his uh, he has uh, the corpse of Hector, Priam's. Uh, son, um, yeah, uh, and of course, uh, this needs this input space needs to be blended with the input space of uh, the catabasis theme. So, how do we solve? Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, the palace uh, in the catabasis theme, the hero needs to reach the, the palace of the dead, of the god of death, of the dead, Hades. But of course, Priam needs to reach the tent of Achilles. And this uh, leads to a clash, a clash in space. These are two different places. Um, so this is uh, this clash is solved by fusion. Um, basically, Achilles' war tent, and the, the word uses klesien, which means war tent, is described as a lofty place, hypselen. Um, actually, it's described as a palace. If you have a look at the uh, text uh, on the right, it's described as a palace with uh, beams of fear, and they had roofed it over with shaggy thatch gathered from the meadows, and they even made a great court, a megalen aulen. So it doesn't look like a, like a tent. It looks like a palace. Also, uh, hypselos, uh, high, lofty, and uh, exactly the same syntax are used in another passage of Homer in the Iliad uh, 20, uh, where, uh, uh, however, it describes a, a wall, a, 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 a high wall. So, uh, in other words, um, Achilles' tent is not described like a tent. It's described as a palace would be described. So here we have a blending of, uh, so a fusion of Achilles' war tent and the palace of Hades. But And we are sure that it's Hades we're talking about because also Achilles is described in the way Hades would be described, the lord of the realm of the dead. Uh, for instance, um, of course, um, in the blend we have uh, Achilles and the god Hades who are linked by a vital relation of analogy. Because the reason why these two uh, elements are uh, combined is because they both are associated with death. Achilles is the killer par excellence in, uh, in the Iliad and Hades is of course uh, the god of death. So um, this uh, relation of analogy is compressed by few, um, uh, by fusion, because Achilles' description um, as the only one who can open the door of his tent is highly reminiscent of Hades' epithet, which is Pulates, fastener of the gates, that you can find in the two examples below. So, uh, well, <coughs> uh, the time is over, so let's uh, uh, summarize our conclusions. In the course of their historical developments, these three mythological traditions, Priam's, Demeter's, and Baldur's myth, have been shaped by a number of distinct influences from different sources. In less abstract terms, such influences happen every time a speaker, in linguistic terms, or a narrator, in uh, narrative terms, for specific reasons uh, linked to the audience, to the context, to the objectives of their performance, compresses two or more originally distinct narrative themes, which we have called traditional possibilities, into a single poetic reality within a single oral performance. And later on, this single oral performance could in itself become a further model, a new traditional possibility for future performances. This compression is uh, often the reason why some plot elements seem to be incoherent or incongruent within the poetic reality of our text. By making, uh, and actually it's, this, is, this is basically on purpose, because by making the compression evident, these impossible realities actually serve a narrative purpose. They serve the purpose of simultaneously evoking multiple distinct narrative themes within a single oral performance, allowing us to decompress, to unpack these mythological narratives and understand their composition better. And uh, 
as I tried to show uh, by with the um, um, example of the unpacking, the compression of the perhaps in the European catabasis theme within Priam's, Dimitrius, and Baldur Smith's, comparative analysis can be essential to help us identify and separate the different narrative themes that are compressed within each myth. So uh, <clears throat> here are the references, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.